Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Anna Decker, and on behalf of the Photographers Gallery, I'd like to welcome you indeed for this evening. Um, we're going to have an interesting program, I think, and I'll be introducing the, the three different speaker and speaker collectives in a minute. Um, before, I will quickly introduce the concept of the evening and why we came to it. Uh, but first of all, uh, as I said, my name is Anna Decker. I'm here actually on behalf of the Photographers Gallery in collaboration with the London South Bank University and in particular the research group, the Centre for the Networked Image. Uh, we have a collaboration since already a couple of years and uh, all in all we have been organising now several events at the Photographers Gallery around what is the networked image. Uh, tonight I uh, will be specifically focusing on a slightly different um, topic. As you have seen, of course, uh, the trafficking of cultural goods. Um, I also really want to thank uh, Joanna, uh, who's now doing uh, the night's nice filming here tonight, and Katrina, who unfortunately couldn't be here, but is the digital curator here, for really shaping and organizing this whole event together with me. So, as I said, the whole event is a, is a result, in a way, of the discussions we've been having at the center about um, the addressing the issues of digitization, particularly of cultural artifacts and also of museum collections. Because as you know, with the rise of the new technologies, of course, the museum collections gradually changed in a way, eh? from the, the objects, the storage, and the depot where all the things were kept. It has been turned into a sort of data set of digital files, and which can be presented everywhere, accessed, reused, distributed, shared, all what you can think of. Now, one of our concerns has really been what happens to these digitized files, these non-objects in a way. Where do they go once they are uploaded to commercial platforms, for example? Where they are passed and analyzed by algorithms, or where they were remade as 3D models and sometimes even sold for profit? Now, an interesting and rather well-known example, in a way, is, is Google's digitization project, The Treasures of the World and which you have this website here. Although their endeavor in a way, as they say, is to digitize as many treasures of the world, and that is of course a good thing in a way. It enables a lot of people to see things which they normally wouldn't, so why really worry about this? But of course it also raises several questions. And for example, um, what happens when people are referred to corporations that are in the business of profit making, instead of states for such information and, and services. What does that mean? Uh, all corporations exist for profit. And in the case of Google, this is to provide third parties with access to web users, to us who do this search and analyzing of the website. And through this content that is generated, it also generates traffic. It tracks users and thus generates more data. The more data, the better it is and the connections and productions it can be made. And that's, of course, very valuable for the people that uh, want that data. So inside Google Cultural Things, you can do all sorts of things with the material. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can turn it around, make selections, create your own curated exhibition. But you cannot really download the information. You cannot place it on your own website, really. You cannot share it or even reuse it in another context. You can just remain in their side. It's a very closed and controlled space in which you are, are doing the things that you want to do. And of course, that's the reason to it. I mean, if Google would let you go out, it would lose your data. It would lose your connection. It would lose money. So no one wants to ha have that happen, of course. Now, there's quite a few people, in a way, who have referred and specifically to this sort of Treasures of the World um, project, to this t type of access as a new form of colonialism. It's been called a commercial or techno-colonialism, in a way. And some even compare this to the motivations behind previous colonial collections, where profits were made from privileged access to certain kinds of information by exploration, discovery and collecting. Now recently, several counter-movements in a way have started. And for example, the non-governmental organization 
uh, collaborative initiative, New Palmyra. It collects data from international partners and uses it to create a digital reconstruction of Palmyra. They present uh, workshops about the process, they share the models online, and all the data is in the public domain, so you can do whatever you want with the data. It has to be said, because oftentimes it happens that it's mistaken for this other project, which you might have seen for those that are based in London here. I recognize this, and it's a sort of like, yes, we know who this is, and we certainly know um, also where the statue was. This is the Palmyra Arcs of Triumph in Trafalgar Square, indeed, in London on World Heritage Day in April 2016, yeah, almost a year ago now. This act, in a way, gave little, very little credence, in a way, to the real complex history and context of this artifact. It really reiterated and reinforced a colonial mindset, in a way, in which Western society was portrayed as civilized, and other societies, in this case the Muslim society, as barbaric vandals, as Boris Johnson really famously has even said so in, in the newspapers. And as critics observed, in a way, after this event, the role of the West in the rise of ISIS, which led to the destruction, actually, of these statues, was really ignored, of course. Now, drawing attention to the importance of this freely shared memory and using the power of technology, the artist uh, Mauritian Aliari devised her own method to counter what she really considers to be this sort of new digital colonialism. In her projects that's here, Material Speculations, she uses uh, 3D modeling and printing to reconstruct selected relics that ISIS has destroyed in Syria, or in, sorry, in Iraq. And based on extensive research and discussions with archeologists, with uh, historians, the Mosul Museum employees, she gathers as many images and videos and maps about the artifacts as possible. However, though, she really lacked the material needed to create a, free, a real comprehensive 3D visualization. So she started creating the models from her own memory and from the catalogs, the tourist snapshots and her own imagination. After the whole model was done, she places a flash drive and a memory card that documented all the research inside of each of the printed um, objects to create a sort of 3D time capsule. And finally, speculating in a way on the past and the future, she moves beyond the sort of merely metaphoric gesture by making the different models and research all available online. So if you want, you could actually also 3D print your own uh, statue. In a way, you could say she proposes a new method for the reconstruction of history. Now, the project offers a real practical and also political archival method for endangered or destroyed artifacts. On the one hand, it reflects the hope that technology will really, will really be a solution to find the destruction that is taking place. And she proposes, in this case, a 3D printing technology as a tool for resistance, as well as for documentation. On the other hand, you could also say, by creating this free and shared system, she really challenges the conventional Western methods of preserving history and how we deal with heritage. And moreover, in a way, by distributing the project in open source, it is also very much a critique on the proprietary infrastructures in most 3D printing, which is now very much controlled by Silicon Valley. And also, of course, those were all copyrighted. We can't really do anything with those 3D models that are created by the Silicon Valley companies. And in a way, that's the sort of copyright in which Google also operates, the sort of the way they, they deal with the, the heritage and as they frame the treasures of the world. That, that wording of the treasures of the world, in a way, is really emphasizes the exclusivity and the hierarchies that are presented within these constellations. And they highlight a sort of very modern version of colonialism, that instead of nation states, is now performed through technology and commercialization. Now, in an attempt to explore methods of decolonization, Mauritian offers a counterexample in which the inherent qualities of technology, such as easy distribution and the sharing of the methods that are part of the work, are also empowering the user. Whereas Coca-Cola Cultural Institute and also many other 
commercial 3D companies lack the sort of defined or ethical position towards the material they use, she really shows the importance of this social life of things as well. That she does that by documenting and presenting the social and cultural changes the objects have endured, and she emphasizes how they acquire value and also meaning. So rather than attempting to preserve cultural heritage in a way, she provides forgotten or destroyed objects and also their uses with a new sort of agency to reenact in the world that is to come. Now, it was really in light of Mauritius' continuing interest in capturing and sharing cultural heritage that we've organized this evening today. And in the back of, the, of our minds, we have the question of how can we design archives and collections that admit to creating alternative futures, that recognize that people require the freedom to construct their own independent infrastructure to escape the time and even subvert, if they wish, the one-directional and neoliberal temporal constructs that have so often been tools of injustice as well. Now, in an attempt to further analyze this question, or a proposition perhaps even, we've invited several people today who will present their views on what could be a decolonialist practice. So, first of all, I would really like to invite Oskar Ersoy here. I will quickly introduce her, and then afterwards, the, I will introduce all the others as well once they come up. So Özge is a curator and writer. She's currently based in Istanbul, but at the moment doing a residency at the Delfina Foundation in London. She works as a managing editor of MS.org, an online publication conceived as an artist-centered initiative. And she's also the program manager of Collector Space, of which she will talk more in a minute. Her main interests revolve around the question of how art institutions shape artistic production and how artists influence the way institutions evolve over time. And this is what she will talk about tonight as well. Questioning the role of collecting practices and considering how we think about ownership and cultural heritage, especially, of course, in the light of the recent acts of destruction of health cultural heritage. So I'll set up the program here for you. Thank you, Annette, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, and thank you, the Photographers Gallery, for hosting us. And thank you for coming on a Friday evening. <laughs> the real thank you goes to you, I guess. Uh, as Annette mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm been co-running Collector Space in Istanbul for the last five and a half years uh, with my colleague, Haro Jumbushan. And uh, I'd like to share with you a couple of exhibitions that we did in this time period. Um, but to begin with, I'd like to say a couple of words about uh, Mauritian Allahiari's work as well, because in her work, uh, the artistic tool that she uses is to, to copy. Uh, and she's not copying, as Annette mentioned, she's not copying uh, the, the cultural artifacts as they are, but uh, she, borrows, um, she borrows fragments, uh, you know, fragments from exhibition catalogues, fragments from photographs, uh, amateur photographs mostly, and fragments of her memory as well. So in a way, she speculates objects. And for me, this gesture opens up um, questions around like shared memory, accessibility, preservation, but especially the, the notion of ownership. Uh, what is that we own? And could reinterpretation be a way of um, ownership? And it's precisely these questions that uh, I'd like to ask and I'd like to discuss today with you, hopefully. And uh, I'll be sharing three exhibitions that, we, uh, that deal with these questions. Um, and this is basically how the space looks like from the, the street level. We are uh, in Istanbul, near Taksim Square. Um, and um, our mission is quite an ambitious one, I have to say, uh, because it's to, to open private contemporary art collections to the public and also to critical review, or at least ask if that's possible. Um, and in contrast to, to the level of ambition of our mission, our space is quite small. It's only um, 20 square meters. It's like four meters by five meters, including the exhibition space that you see here uh, the, and the office space and the library. So everything in 20 meters. But the, we're lucky that uh, two of our walls are completely in glass. Um, I'd like to say a couple of words about the architecture of the space because I think it says a lot about the, the questions that we ask. Um, when you see, sorry, I'll go back to, to the next one. 
uh, it's not the perfect white cube gallery that you would expect to see. You know, on the floors, you know, you see the, the, the old wooden floors and there is this huge column in the middle of everything. And uh, in this part, there's a small chunk of marble. So everything looks a little bit strange in the space. Uh, but, and the reason for that is um, it used to be part of the living room that's behind this main wall. Uh, around 20 years ago, the, the father in the family who lives in the, the apartment, he wanted to have a workshop space for himself. And he literally built two walls in the corner of their living room on the ground floor. It's a little bit higher up from the street level. And, um, and there's a separate entry for that. Uh, and after him, a book bus company took over, and after that, it was us who occupied the space. But for us, you know, the, the, as I said, the architecture says a lot, uh, because you know, these are the questions that we are interested in. What is public, what is private, and whether accessibility is enough to create a sense of publicness. Um, and just the one line about the format that we use, uh, in the photographs you will always see only a single artwork because uh, every exhibition, for every exhibition we only exhibit a single artwork that we borrow from a private art collection and we do programming about that particular artwork and there's a one public event, one video with the collector and one publication in the end. So the, the first exhibition I'd like to speak about is um, with a work uh, by Julian Bismuth, the artist, and the, the person that you see on the photograph is Greg Goldstone, the mime artist that Bismuth collaborated for his work, Mime Works uh, 1 to 4, from 2010. Um, and if I can say briefly about what Bismuth is interested in, is basically um, how the question of how people communicate beyond language. Um, you know, what do gestures say and what is the, the limitation for the limitation of expression there? And uh, it was they, Julian Bismuth and Greg Goldstone, they choreographed the, the piece together. It's a half an hour piece performance. And uh, it's only Goldstone himself who's activating the work. And um, the work is basically about things that occur around one artwork. So when he enters the gallery, as the mime, he carries an artwork and then he hangs, it, he hangs the artwork on the wall and then he sees something in the artwork, then his entire relationship to the artwork changes. So, uh, and after that, you know, imagine like Alice in Wonderland, right? I mean, he uh, climbs up spiral staircases, then he squeezes himself into a small box, um, or he falls off a cliff, so all of these acts they are followed by his uh, impersonation of the different characters who are um, relating themselves to the artwork. People who are looking at it, the art historian, the collector, the artist, the Wall Street guy on the phone who's not really, who doesn't really care about the artwork. So all of these different impersonations. And, uh, but there's no work, but, and the work is only suggested by the mime artist gestures themselves. For me, one of the interesting um, points during this exhibition, which lasted around uh, eight weeks, so he performed, the way, he performed the work at least twice a day uh, for this duration. It, was, it came up in a very informal conversation with Goldstone himself. Uh, I asked him, who do you think really owns the work? Uh, and I would probably expect a more, um, you know, kind of, What's the word? Flexible answer, but he immediately said, the work is mine, because Julian Bismuth would claim that uh, it's his work, because he's the artist, he sold the, um, the work to a collector as the artist, etc. But at the end of the day, if you ask him to activate the work, he won't be able to do it. It's only my body who knows the work, and that's the reason why I'm the real owner. So it was a small and simple but provocative answer from his side. But then we went to the collectors, and uh, the work comes from the Jean Solan collection in Marseille, in France. Uh, it's José and Marc Jean Solan who own the work. And when we spoke to them and asked, you know, who's the real owner and what does ownership mean to you, uh, they told us that ownership doesn't have to be dependent on tangible phys physical artworks themselves. And for them, it's mostly about transmission of an idea. Um, they've been collecting this over 40 years now. Uh, they started in the early 1970s. And uh, they are both psychiatrists, and they try to, to reflect their professional practice into their collecting practice. So the, the works that they are interested in, these are works that are transmitted by words, sentences, 
um, by instructions, by dates, by traces. So um, when we speak about ownership, uh, it's, um, they just say that they are transmitters or they are the carriers of knowledge uh, of a particular form of art. Uh, and I think the way that they speak about ownership, you know, it allows us to, to think about the idea of, um, you know, what happens to, the, uh, to this particular notion when it's based on only encounter and conversation. Um, this is another photograph from the performance. And I will uh, continue with um, a work by Anita De Bianco, uh, Corrections and Clarifications, uh, that we borrow from the, the Bas collection based in Istanbul. Uh, Anita started this newspaper project in 2001, and uh, it basically mimics the, the regular format of daily newspapers. Um, but the content that you would read is not the um, usual journalistic material that you would find in daily newspapers. It's rather a selection from the corrections and clarification section. So you will see um, corrections of typographical mistakes or factual mistakes or statements to clear up misunderstandings that are published in daily newspapers. Um, and the, the work is always printed uh, in multiple editions. Uh, think of between 500 and 5,000. And she uh, made several editions of the series. Um, I guess it's been 16 editions so far in different languages, in different places. Um, and it's always distributed free. Uh, and so it's meant to be passed along uh, di or discarded or found in a rubbish bin or just discovered accidentally. Um, so you might think that it's just she's throwing a stone into a black hole, but um, we believe that it, it is a conceptual exercise to explore power relations of print journalism when you see random and systematic errors, um, both intentional and unintentional errors altogether as you read it. So it's, uh, you have to experience the work, in my opinion. And uh, the work, this is how we presented the work. So we transformed the, um, our exhibition space into a reading room. And the work belongs to, to the Bas collection, as I mentioned. Uh, it is initiated and it's run by Banu Cennetoğlu, who's hiding in the back in the photograph. Uh, she's an artist herself. And her collection only focuses on multiple edition artist books or printed materials that are produced by artists themselves. Um, and for us, um, an artist book collection of this type already constitutes uh, a sort of resistance against the, the idea of object-based preciousness that is still very, very foundational to, to the mainstream art channels. Uh, and on top of that, Janet Olu uh, started an open acquisition policy from the very beginning, uh, when she was buying or when she was accepting or when she was bartering artist books. So, um, so far she has always favored the idea of diversity um, rather than personal taste or personal selection. And uh, the collection overall, uh, it has grown um, through the acquaintances and also coincidences with and around artists themselves and the publisher themselves. And uh, for her, Buzz uh, would be more like an entity in and of itself rather than an accumulation of artworks. Uh, and it does tell stories all about um, these coincidences that I just mentioned. And the last exhibition that I will talk about is, um, it includes a work by Dominique Gonzalez Foster. Uh, it's titled Untitled from 2010. Uh, it comes from the Cervantes collection in Mexico City. And uh, you might be familiar with, um, with her practice, but in her work, what she does is not to create, she doesn't really uh, care about making objects, but mostly about creating environments for certain things. And in this case, uh, the work is pretty straightforward. You see 300 kilos of fine sand uh, that's placed in the corner of the room, and you see a book on top of it, and it's uh, Roberto Bolaño's The Savage Detectives. And it's open to a very particular page. For those who are familiar with the book, uh, you would remember that um, two characters are looking for a 1920s poet, 
and these three lines, they are the visual poems that this person, that this, that this character created. Uh, the only specs that we received for the installation was that it would be fine sand, 300 kilos, this book, Spanish version, uh, this particular page, and I had to, because I do take care of the exhibitions all the time, uh, I had to make this uh, or replicate the wavy line every single day because, because it's fine sand, it would dissolve um, after the, the end of the day. Um, and I would say that Gonzalez Foster doesn't take the book only as a literary text, but uh, she thinks about the book as a living organism. You know, imagine the, the Natural History Museum um, type of display. I mean, she's creating kind of a habitat for the book. Um, and at the end of the exhibition, what we did was, uh, by the way, we ordered the book online and we just uh, called a construction worker to bring us the sand. And at the end of the exhibition, we distribute the sand to, to people who need it in the neighborhood and we put the, the book back into our library. And it was this very, um, it was precisely this temporary togetherness, so to speak, or temporary juxtaposition that we were very much interested in because there is, the, in terms of the aesthetic sensibility, it does reflect the, the collection that it belongs to as well. Um, and it's a collection uh, by, that is made by Cesar Cervantes himself uh, and there's a very particular story behind it. Cesar starts collecting in the 1990s and he only buys paintings by Mexican modernists. And around 2000, there's a shift in his collection and he um, switches, to, su switches his interest to contemporary art, but mostly conceptual art, starting, around, starting with the 1960s. Um, and uh, when we met Cesar, uh, he was speaking about how he made that shift, because basically he sold his entire painting collection in 2000, in 2000 and um, he started with only two artists, with the work of Onkavara and with the work of Gabriel Orozco. And he acquired all the books, and then looked for the references that these artists would give, and then he went to the next references and the next references. So imagine the collection um, forming like a tree with two major chunks or roots, so to speak. Um, and we were also interested in a question that Cesar was asking, Cervantes was, Cesar Cervantes was asking, it was how to end the collection, because most of the time we assume that we start a collection and then it goes forever. Um, he was the one who told us that he was interested, he was just playing with that idea of ending his collection uh, for several reasons, but not necessarily for financial reasons, and that was the reason why we were interested in talking to him. Uh, first reason was that he thinks that uh, an art collection should not be very different from a film or from a literary work uh, or a song. You know, as long as it can tell a good story and as long as it's consistent, uh, it can as well come to an end. And the, the second uh, reason why he wanted to, to end his collection was um, he expresses discontent with the direction of the art market. So for these two reasons, uh, Cesar also, um, Cesar himself, uh, wanted to dissolve the entire collection like he did in 2000. And uh, instead of the collection, he acquired um, I believe a work of art. Uh, it's uh, Casa Pedregal in Mexico City. If you've been there, it's one of the, the major works by um, Mexican architect Luis Barragan. And right now, uh, he doesn't live with any of the works because he thinks that you know, he is now able to be surrounded by a single artwork and he doesn't really want to juxtapose different artworks next to this one. Uh, we had a conversation about ending the collection or not. He still um, argues that that is the end of the collection and that that house has nothing to do with the collection. But for us, I would agree, I would argue that uh, it's kind of a continuation, it's kind of the transformation of the idea of the collection. So practice is a, thinking around that, collecting as a practice in motion and uh, practice that also impacts the different uh, infrastructures around it. Um, I think I will end in do I have like two minutes? Okay, perfect. Um, because you would probably think that, um, you know, it's only contemporary art and it's only about this field, but um, 
I wanted to put these projects on the, on the table as sort of provocations for us to, to speak more about the idea of ownership. Because uh, for me, the, the common point among these works is that they require um, audiences beyond the collections that they belong to. Because they require activation, they require participation. And um, I'm just interested in the question of um, how could we rethink the ownership of participation rather than the more conventional ideas. And uh, of course, contemporary art is about today often today, but it's also, um, it also projects towards the future because it's also about what it remains and uh, what is passed on to um, other audiences, other artists, to museums, or, you know, sometimes it just dissolves. So I'm interested uh, if we could ask the following question, and I will end there, um, especially in regards to, to cultural heritage or cultural art artifacts, how could ownership be fragmented and um, transformed following these examples? So, thanks for listening. I think what was really interesting, I was getting your, in, in your uh, presentation also, sorry, <laughs> that it is indeed not just about giving access to people, it's also how to um, how can you control access uh, and also for the audience but it's also how can you set actually the terms for gaining access and I think that's also something that I hope to be coming back to um, after the free presentations so for now I uh, will have a presentation by two actually uh, Sari Nankavel is still sitting up there but she is Canadian and graduated last year from the University of Cambridge in her research, she focuses on the destruction of heritage site in conflict and the discursive representations of these events through the media. Uh, currently, though, she's part of Forensic Architecture, and in addition, she coordinates an upcoming exhibition for the University of Cambridge Festival in Ideas 2017. And that will investigate the nexus between heritage and truth through the reconstruction of Syrian heritage. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Now, next to me is Anna Naomi de Souza, an independent and award-winning documentary filmmaker and journalist from London, with a very strong interest in politics, resistance, and the built environment. And she works pretty much all over the world. Now, she collaborated with uh, Forensic Architecture for multiple occasions. And Forensic Architecture, to really give you some idea for those of you who don't know, they're based in Goldsmiths, a research group that undertakes advanced architectural and media research on behalf of international prosecutors, human rights organizations, as well as political and environmental justice groups. One of their main aims is producing and presenting architectural evidence for the pursuit of accountability. Now, together with uh, Sarah, Anna will now address the development of their, one of their latest projects they worked on, the Site Naya prison project in Syria. Thank you. Thanks very much for uh, inviting us to be here today. Um, normally, I, I would talk a bit about forensic architecture, but we just got a great introduction to it. Um, there are lots of very, very different projects that forensic architecture has undertaken, is undertaking, and I would recommend you have a look at the website to get an idea of um, the sort of range of different things. Um, the project I'm going to talk about, or rather Sarah and I are going to talk about um, today, is Sidnaya. Um, it was a collaboration between Amnesty International and Forensic Architecture um, undertaken last year. Um, this is, I mean, it's quite different from the other things that we're talking about in a way because it's about the reconstruction um, of a place that nobody really wants to reconstruct, um, which is a prison um, in Syria run by the um, Assad government. We were approached, we, Forensic Architecture, were approached by Amnesty International at the beginning of last year. Um, they had been gathering testimony um, about human rights abuses in prisons in Syria, um, including but not limited to Sidnaya, and they had been trying to find people who would um, give their evidence, and they wanted a way of, of visualising and dealing with that material. The main problem we had with this project at the beginning was that this was the only verifiable image of Sidnaya that we had. So it's a prison that no uh, journalists or independent human rights observers had access to. And although there were some videos and images that were supposedly from Sidnaya, 
and we weren't able to verify them. This satellite image is the only image we had to begin with. And to build on that, we had a series of interviews that Amnesty researchers had conducted on the ground with a small number of people who had survived um, a prison that an awful lot of people were believed not to have survived. What we decided to do was um, to fly to Turkey. Um, Amnesty had identified six people um, who were willing and able to give us their testimony, and they were all at that point in Turkey. So we actually went to Istanbul. The methodology that we decided to start with was um, something that had been developed on a previous project about drone strikes, which involved spatial reconstructions and interviews with people. So the idea being that during a process of modeling and reimagining re the spaces in which certain events have occurred, it helped people to remember and to re recollect testimony in a different way than sort of traditional human rights um, or journalistic interviews. So we used partly the model that we had um, built based on the previous testimony from um, the Amnesty researchers. And then with each of the survivors, we spent an entire day doing modeling. So we were using architectural software and placing objects and modeling the sizes of rooms and spaces that they could remember. So I'm going to play you a short um, clip here. I should warn you, these are very uh, points, very graphic descriptions of um, things that happened to people whilst they were in detention. اوكي وهذا ايش ايش في تحت على هذا الارتفاع؟ نفس هي الشراقه اللي سم... نفس الشيء اللي سميناه طاقه، شيء تحت بسموه شراقه. بقى على قد ايه عرضها؟ آه عرضها بقدر طلع منه وش يعني طول وشي اطول من وشي بشعره. وهذا ارتفاعها وعرضها بالنسبه للباب يعني يعني هي الباب لا هي عرضها، انا عم بحكي عن عرضها ما عم بحكي آه يعني. هي الباب تمام؟ اوكي. إذا قلنا هي الباب هي هون صاير على ارتفاع 30 سم هي عريضة هي مستطيلة تمام ليش أكبر بالعرض؟ لأنه أنا هي واحدة من العقوبات اللي تعاقبتها جوا هي إني أطلع راسي من قلب هي الطاقة وينتعس علي راسي يعني هلا إذا هلا خليني أنا أرسم لك وشي هون مرة من المرات لحنا اجى السجان طلب هيك طلب قال ليش ما نضيف زنزانتكم؟ لانه لحنا ما عندنا مواد، لحنا عالم جرباني، لحنا عنا ما عندنا مي، لحنا عنا ما عنا ما عنا اي وسيله لحتى نقدر نضيف زنزانه. قال لي مدرسك. او انا ما فهمت. قال لي مدرسك. قلت له من وين؟ قال لي مدرسك من هون. عم انا قلت لحالي اكذب قلت له ما بيطلع هو فعلا راسي بالطول ما بيطلع قلت له ما بيطلع قال بالعرض بيعرف حاله انه بالعرض بيطلع راسي فعملت هيك ففعليا انا وقت عملت هيك راسي بالعرض مرق بالعرض بال... يعني وقت صار العرض تبع راسي هو الطول الطبيعي وبعد ما طلعته بالعرض رجع جلس لي اياه بحصه جوزي تحلقي على زي ال هي هذا الزيت تبع الشراقه بسموه انا صار راسي برا ونط هيك بكل وزنه بكل وزنه نط ولاحظ على راسي طبعا انا هون بلش يعني في قطع تنفس في شيء بدماغي بلش انه حسيت الدنيا عم تدور حواليا لاحظ لاحظ اثنين ثلاثه قام انا حاولت اسحب وشي رجع واسحب وشي عم حاول اسحب وشي قام علي هون خدي على الحيز وصار ينط ويدعس ينط ويدعس ينط ويدعس لدرجه انه صار يصير الدم كلياته على الارض طبعا انا عم بحكيها بقصه ثواني بس هو الم شديد جدا وازلال شديد جدا وتركني بس تركني يعني فيكم تقولوا شو فاقد الوعي So what you can see here is an example of how the modeling um, of, a, of a very specific spatial detail has then led on to um, the recollection of what Amnesty really was interested in, which is um, the testimony about human rights abuses within, within the prison. 
Um, it's also for us an example of how the architecture of the prison was being used as a weapon of torture um, against people who were incarcerated there. Um, so part of the modeling process, as I explained, was using this architectural software. The other part that was very important was sound. Um, Sidnaya, like other similar prisons that we also heard about, um, the detainees were kept in almost complete darkness for the entirety of their incarceration. For some people, that was many, many years. Um, they were blindfolded when they were moved around the prison. Actually, the recollections that they had of the spaces that they saw in the prison were very, were very limited. But what they did have was a very rich and detailed um, memory of sound and different sounds of the prison. So we started to work with those sounds. Lawrence Abrahamson is an, an artist in private ear who, who works with, um, with sound. So he was talking to detainees about what specifically they could recall, what had they heard, and how loud were the sounds. There was a lot of work on um, whispering and um, sounds that were traveling up through the building. And it was helping us to build a picture of, of what it was like being incarcerated there. سبنايا يعني الهدوء هو سياد الموقف في كتير هدوء ما فيك تعلي صوتك ما فيك تحكي بصوت عالي دائما لازم تكون نبرة صوتك واطية فهذا الشيء بخليك تسمع كل شيء بيبني تصور للأشكال والأشخاص معتمد على إيش على الأصوات اللي ممكن تصدر أثناء وجود هاي الأجسام اللي الخارجية اللي موجودة معه فممكن هو يعرف الشخص من وقع خطواته ممكن يعرف الشخص من صوته ممكن يعرف مواعيد مثلا الطعام من من صوت الاوعيه الطعام كذا درجة السمع هون بتصير اقوى ليش لان يعتمد على هاي على هاي الحاسه اكثر من غيرها هو تباقي الحواس مقابل هاي الحاسه فيك تقلي بس عن الصدى بالزنزان الصدى انه بتحطه هون في كليك بس تقلي اذا هيدا الصدى ولا اكبر ولا اصغر هيك هيك كثير ناشف يعني ما كثير في صدى ما كثير في ناس كثير ايه في ناس كثير لا ما بصير في صدى بس ليكون قاعد واحد لحاله ممكن يكون في صدى ايه هيك هلا انت قاعد بتسمع بالزنزانات بسمع صوت انه اجت سياره سياره هذا بنقول اجت دفعه جهزوا حالكم هدي اجت دفعه كانه هل صار فينا بصير فيهم هيك كل كم يوم نفس الطريقه نفس الشيء نفس السيناريو اللي اللي صار بيصير معنا فهل بيجوا جداد على صدنايا؟ فنحن بنعرف انه جاي ناس جداد لما بنسمع عياط لما ما بنسمع لما لما بيكون ما في عياط بنعرف انه هدول الناس قاعدين من قلب السجن عم ينقتلوا فالنية لاكس تماما اذا اذا بتصرف بيزيد القتل اذا بتسكت بيخف الاكل القتل لا حتى يوقف So these videos that I'm showing you are um, actually part of the final model, which, because of the limitations of PowerPoint, I can't actually show you, but it's on the website. So if you, if you go onto the website, what you have is a model that you can move around, and the testimony of each of the interviewees is embedded in the location of the cells, which, which as far as we can um, tell based on the interviews and the reconstruction process, were their cells. There is one important point about this project, which is, um, and I think relates to reconstructions and replicas in general, the, which is distortions and the contradictions. So obviously the people that we were interviewing had suffered um, incredible uh, trauma. All of their testimonies actually differed regarding s certain s spatial details um, of the prison, and it wasn't always possible to resolve these. Um, one of the... One of the detainees, when he left, said he, when he left the prison, he looked back and he saw a 10-story building behind him. He was sure it was 10 stories. We know it was only two stories. Um, a lot of the prisoners recalled the entrance, the entrance to the prison differently. Some said they went up steps, some said they went down steps, some said there were no steps. 
But their moment of arrival at Sydney was also terrifying, so it's perfectly understandable to us why those distortions and contradictions exist. But the challenge of the project was finding a way to work with those. Um, this is a short example of um, one of these cases. Um, an impression from the website that I was describing to you. This is the reconstruction of the prison and the location of the different cells and then those videos. So this video, um, Anas's memory, even though we know it not to be correct, as in we know spatially the corridor is a straight line, is, is included in it. And that was one of the ways that we just were trying to work with the, with the distortions. For us, they were important examples that were also evidence, actually, of trauma. Um, and, and of the violations that had been committed um, in Sydney. Um, so it's not always, a, a, it's not meant to be a realistic reconstruction, um, but it is meant to reflect the sort of dis, the disorientating and, and terrifying experience um, of being incarcerated in a place like Sydney without actually trying to recreate it. Um, some of the detainees were wanted, when we asked them what what would you want to see happen to Sydney? I said, no, by the way, it's still running. It's still a prison. That nothing has changed. Um, they, some of them said that they wanted it to be torn down, but some of them said that they thought it should be um, turned into a museum. They wanted it to be kept, and they wanted the memory of what had happened there to be kept alive. And that was something that we were very conscious of whilst we were doing, undertaking this process of reconstruction. And I think I will hand over to Sarah. Thank you. So, um, to bring this back to the kind of heritage uh, element of the talk today, so I think that there's a lot that we can learn um, from the Sednaya project when it comes to kind of digitization and reconstruction of heritage. Um, on the one hand, there's the kind of utility of the techniques and methods that we used, um, and then there's also the value of integrating local knowledge with technology. So as Annette touched on uh, earlier, one of the key issues in modern heritage preservation and practices is that local knowledge is often um, ignored or if it's collected at all, it tends to be sort of considered separate from and inferior to kind of expert knowledge. Um, and for far too long, heritage preservation has kind of worked to sanitize and uh, decontextualize the very sites and objects that it aims to protect. So as Annette said, it used to be you know, that Western archaeological teams go in and they employ locals to dig up artifacts, and they take these artifacts away, they put them in European museums, or they were sold into the art market. Um, and now, you know, the, while this is not quite the same common practice, we do have this kind of digital colonialism um, where Western teams will come in, they'll collect data, or they'll you know, scan a building or an artifact, um, particularly the material qualities of that building, 
Um, and then the data is taken away and it's used and manipulated um, miles, thousands of miles away from its sort of source. And the narratives that accompany it are also used and manipulated thousands of miles away. And we do tend to end up with a completely different understanding of the sort of significance and history of a site that you get when um, it's experienced in context. And so as a result, these kind of modern heritage narratives and practices that we work with tend to sort of necessarily reject the local identification um, of the significance of a site. And it does enhance class distinctions that are established through the sort of circulation of culture as a commodity. Um, you know, and as Morrison has so eloquently put in her past and present work, technology is a political medium. And the kind of process of reusing and reinterpreting heritage through technology um, does bring a new set of values and meanings uh, for both the original artifact and its sort of reconstruction. So used irresponsibly, the digitization of heritage can further widen the gap between the local experience of a place um, and the data that's collected uh, by archaeologists and heritage professionals and then turned into narratives that are presented to the public in all these different ways. The example I was going to use for this was the 3D printed <laughs> um, art of uh, Triumph from Palmyra. It put up in Trafalgar Square. Um, and I agree that there's this kind of need to move away from this monotonous sort of neo-colonial narrative into a new model where multiple voices um, are seen as equal contributors to the protection and presentation of heritage. So this kind of brings us back to Sednaya. Um, and the good news is that we, as we, sort of, as we have seen in the Sednaya project, there's huge potential to incorporate local knowledge with technology and to bring these two things together as equal, equally valued sources of evidence and knowledge um, for reconstructing and preserving buildings and other material things. So the first sort of key benefit of this approach, I think, in, from a heritage perspective, um, is that we are able to kind of reconstruct both experience as well as materials. Um, and this has a huge impact both in the kind of research process and the presentation um, of our findings. You know, with heritage, it's the experience of a site that makes it more than just a pile of stones. It, it's just a building until we have memories and traditions and experiences, however sort of horrible these may be. And we do see this, you know, with a, you know, a lot of sites that are, you know, Holocaust memorial sites, different things like this where they have been kept. Um, sort of despite their very dark past. And, you know, who better understands or has a wider range of experiences with this site than those who live with and care for it. So in the Sanaya project, we begin to see the possibilities of what we can achieve with technology when witness testimony is respected and valued um, and integrated into the process of actually making the model um, as opposed to being kind of an aside or an afterthought of this kind of other information. Um, and it's more interesting not only for the researcher and, you know, it allows us to, there was all these questions we would never have thought of in the Sednaya project had, you know, we not sort of been asking witnesses about this and things that we would never have considered. So it's, it brings kind of a much more interesting experience for the researcher but also for the viewer, you know, in the presentation of Sednaya which we can't sort of see on the website, um, but it's this very powerful, detailed, and engaging experience where you can click through all these different things and hear these different experiences, and it sort of both brings to light the like horrific violations and the human element um, of what we're trying to convey through these sort of architectural models. Um, but it's also accessible in a way to a wider audience, and it allowed us to bring to light um, the you know what had happened to these people in this space. And it's, it's, frankly, it's, it's actually, it's, I, what's kind of amazing about it too is that it's a very effective way of doing a reconstruction. You know, when you have no images or if something has been destroyed or maybe it was a site that isn't as photographed as Palmyra, um, it could be a very useful method in restoring that heritage. And it brings other forms of knowledge that are not necessarily just the kind of visual aspect. You know, we saw how important hearing is. And, um, you know, so it, in terms of accessibility, so many different kinds of people with different abilities visit heritage sites and we have to kind of move beyond just standing in front of them in this roped off site and you look at it and you pay for your ticket and then you leave. You know, there are people experience things in different ways. But I mean, I think what is ultimately most important to take away from this um, is that there is a potential for technology 
to restore a sense of agency and empowerment um, to, to the users of a place. So the witnesses who we, it's, as Anna said, some of these witnesses um, wanted to keep the building open as a museum. Um, and in the process, a lot of them talked about how there was a kind of sense of empowerment and how being able, a sense of closure as well. And they were able to kind of externalize the building and to see it and to have this sense of control over it and manipulate it and be part of the modeling process. And I think that was, you know, one of the best things that came out of this project. Um, and, you know, never correcting the victims, allowing them to say, you know, to give the, their experiences, even if it was technically wrong, um, I think is such an important part of this. So rather than sort of silencing different and even competing or incorrect narratives, um, we should really strive to embrace those narratives as legitimate experiences and vital sources of information. Um, in order, you know, to save historic sites and to save the history of a place, you have to, we have to save you know, we have to value the people as well. It's all one and the same. Um, and I think as a heritage professional, you need to very reflexively reevaluate um, the systems and methods that we use to conduct archaeology or any kind of research process in the first place and begin to respect local experiences as evidence um, and local people themselves as vital contributors to the process. Um, and to move towards a more... Um, negotiated, communicative way of conducting this kind of work. Thank you. Great. Thank you both very much for this very enlightening uh, talk, indeed. It's, it's very interesting, of course, indeed, how um, communities are becoming more and more important. And even those communities are people, individuals, whose past has been completely rubbed out. And perhaps indeed through these new methods can imagine a new uh, future for themselves as well. Um, so to come to the last presentation, this is Noor uh, Munua. He is Palestinian Syrian, born and raised in Aleppo and currently based in Amsterdam, where he's doing his PhD research in archeology span at the University of Amsterdam. His uh, main interest is in cultural heritage management and conflict archaeology. And his current research is focused on the reconstruction of Syria and Iraqi cultural heritage in post-conflict context. Um, he will address the various attitudes toward cultural heritage sites in these conflict areas. And he will focus on how these intersect with identity and collective memory. So he will continue perfectly from the last presentations. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for Annette, Iona, everyone participated in this event. Can you hear me well, Iona? That sounds good? Okay, great. So to start with, I'm going to talk in general about heritage at war. I'm going to give a specific example or specific focus on Palmyra, since it's like the world heritage site and one of the most uh, seen sites on the media. Uh, okay. So today, today's Western academic writings and media reports present charismatic archaeology, such as Palmyra, as the point at which Europe ends, ignoring that this heritage not only belongs to Europe, but is originally Syrian and represents the identity and memories of local population. Therefore, today I will seek to answer the following question. Who owns the past? This question features in almost every cultural heritage discourse and is most often taken in, uh, to relate the to the archaeology of indigenous people and to the repat repatriation of cultural property. The question may also be posed, however, in relation to the cultural heritage in conflict zones. My talk today explores the issues that arise from the destruction of archaeological sites during the ongoing war in Syria. I seek to answer the questions often also by these reactions and the symbolic character of Palmyra's monuments. As some have asked, why haven't Aleppo Umayyad Mosque, or the minaret of the Umayyad Mosque, or the ancient gates of Nimrud in, and Nineveh in Iraq also been reconstructed, similarly to the Ark of Triumph of Palmyra? This question triggers larger questions regarding the parameters of heritage reconstruction as a practice. Isn't through the process of decay and loss that monuments are incorporated into archaeological records? Furthermore, 
isn't damage or destruction just another phase of the life history of monument, albeit a less positive one in terms of long-term preservation? Finally, I will discuss the issues that need to be considered when attempts are made to restore monuments in a place of ongoing conflict, such as the perimeter of Palmyra. Since the revolutionary movements or the so-called Arab Spring in the Middle East and Northern Africa turned into serious armed conflicts in Egypt, Libya, Syria, Yemen and Iraq, numerous national and international initiatives have emerged to promote and protect cultural heritage. The threats of cultural heritage destruction, the threats, the threats of cultural heritage destruction differ from country to country, as much as the level of damage that occurred to archaeological sites and facilities. Fears and concerns have rapidly grown after ISIS controlled the World Heritage Site of Palmyra in May 2015. Social media platforms started rapidly to recirculate videos and pictures of the jihadi militia destroying the artifacts of the Mosul Museum to bring the attention to the fact that Palmyra might shortly face a similar fate. 23rd of August 2015 is the date that has been engraved in the memory of all humanity and in particular the memory of the Syrian people. At that exact date, the series of iconoclastic destruction of monuments started when ISIS dynamited and blew up the 2,000 years old Baal Shamin temple. The destruction was followed, up, was followed by blowing up again one of the most significant temples in the Middle East, Temple of Baal. Less than two weeks later, the radical jihadists destroyed Palmyra's Roman monument, Ark of Triumph. Media reports promptly surveyed to cover all these incidents that occurred in less than four months of ISIS control of Palmyra. Ignoring together with the international community that Palmyra had been threatened before the ISIS offensive, offensive attack to control the World Heritage Site. Since the beginning of the Syrian conflict, Palmyra has extensively witnessed several types of damage, such as looting, collateral damage, army occupation and weapons fire by both of the fighting parties the government and the opposition. In a later stage of the conflict, the media promoted the recapture of Palmyra by the Russian-backed Syrian army as a liberation of the World Heritage Site. All this triggers significant debate, debates, starting from questioning how objective the media was when they shed light only on ISIS destruction of heritage sites in Palmyra, Nimrud, and Nineveh. Is ISIS the only bad guy in the Syrian and Iraqi conflicts? What are the, semantic, the semantics and the impacts of the vows of Syria's government? <coughs> Sorry. What are the semantics and impacts of the vows of Syria's government to rebuild Palmyra immediately after the jihadi group withdrew for the first time, of course, and even though the war in Syria is still snowballing? And can the state, ar the, can, can the state promises or the modern art restoration technologies in some way replicate or recreate the authenticity of a contested heritage? And if so, who should decide that and when? And to what extent should the promised reconstruction happen? So I'm going to build my argument based on several questions, then I'm going to get to the end. Hopefully you will be a little bit patient. So uh, the multicultural, economic and sociocultural values of Palmyra encouraged invaders to seize the city and claim its stewardship in order to benefit from its wealth, prosperity, and geopolitical dimensions. Palmyra's advantages caused it to become as an Arabic metaphor, the king's cake, which is a pure indication to the continuous attempts of others, national, international, and regional powers, to control the object over time. Speaking of stakeholders direct us, first of all, to the local people, the Syrians, who were born, lived, and participated in constructing Palmyra's fame through history. Scholars consider that conflict and social disorder result in a severe damage and loss of irreplaceable and unique things, in addition to psychologically affecting people linked to those sites. The importance of Palmyra for, uh, the importance of Palmyra for the local people lies in it being part of the ancestor heritage and the memories of the whole society regardless of the religion or ethnicities of those locals. Palmyra is a place that all Syrians feel proud of, and its remembrance has enhanced the sense of cultural identity, which is one of the few things that unifies Syrians 
during the current war and has that, uh, that, that has torn apart the Syrian society. The strategic central location of Palmyra has encouraged the armed opposition groups to pursue control over the city ever since the ongoing conflict in Syria started in 2011. Concurrently, the Syrian government sought to protect the seizure of the city by all possible means, even though those military actions are considered as violations and threats to the World Heritage Site of Palmyra. The greed of both parts of the conflict, conflict to control the site or the city of Palmyra prior to the emergence of ISIS. Here I'm talking everything before ISIS. So the greed of both sides of the conflict was not aiming to protect the archaeological heritage, but was rather an attempt to rule over, over Palmyra, which would ultimately generate a boost to the popular legitimacy of either the government or opposition as the protector of Syria's heritage and identity from demolition. The escalating violence of Syria's war has introduced the establishment of non-state radical actors, such as Al-Nusra Front and ISIS, who in a later stage sought similarly to control Palmyra. Eventually, Palmyra fell under the mercy of the self-proclaimed Islamic State in May 2015. The radical fighters of ISIS focused primarily on the cultural cleansing of the areas they control. They raised ancient sites as a whole and even though those sites are considered holy places to some Islamic groups opposing ISIS ideology and beliefs. ISIS has produced several videos and images of the destruction of the monumental <coughs> buildings in Palmyra, claiming that those objects were not used to, uh, claiming that those objects were used to promote infidelity and therefore should be, should be demolished. School, scholars have seen ISIS videos and photos as documentary materials in which radical fighters were identified as iconoclasts. ISIS's interest in Palmyra was not based only on ideological perspective of destroying any non-Muslim heritage. The aim of the idol's destruction by ISIS in Palmyra, Hatra and Mosul Museum undoubtedly indicates the need to bring the attention of their existence and to increase the number of their volunteers. The other factor is that ISIS aimed constantly at erasing the extraordinary collective identity and memory of, uh, of Palmyra in a way that would facilitate creating a new identity and memory of the place to represent the new population of ISIS. On the other side of the tragedy, on the other side of the discussion, the tragedy of the last five years is that heritage destruction appeared to fo ha has appeared to focus on the self-image of the West, Russia, China, and how these global powers manage this conflict on the political, humanitarian, and even cultural sides. After ISIS controlled Palmyra, people started to whisper about a possible Russian military intervention to support the, the Syrian government army in the combat against terrorism in general and ISIS in particular. Four months later, Russia declared that, that backing the Syrian government to liberate Palmyra from ISIS hands is one of their priorities. March 27, 2016, the Syrian army recaptured Palmyra for the first time and liberated it from ISIS. But another type of occupation took place by the Syrian and Russian soldiers. Nevertheless, the Syro-Russians celebrated the liberation of Palmyra by holding a concert of, the Rus of a Russian orchestra, an online speech of Vladimir Putin, as we can see. The president of Russia was broadcasted on the same Roman amphitheater that ISIS used less than 10 months prior to that to behead a group of prisoners. This confirms how heritage is usually utilized during war periods as a weapon in a propaganda battles. The latter point, the latter point evidenced that the Russian propaganda aimed, at, aimed to asserting that Russia is not just a defender of a tyrant regime in the Middle East, but is also the defender of Western civilizations, values, and traditions. The site in itself has started to represent a new tendency in the West which lately has emerged, has emerged to justify the European interest in protecting and reconstructing what ISIS destroyed by claiming that Palmyra's heritage is part of a European heritage. The West, including Russia, sees the heritage of the Near East as being part of Europe's story and the origins of the Western civilization. This idea has been reinforced by over a century of archaeological exploration by Western archaeologists. In addition to 
Unfortunately, statements of the Syrian government officials, such as Mamoun Abdel Karim, Syria's director of antiquities, who said during the ceremony of erecting the replica of Ark of Triumph here in London, Palmyra's heritage is not just for Syrian people. Three months ago, or several months ago, and while the majority of the media reports were busy with the liberation of Eastern Aleppo, Palmyra was suddenly reoccupied by ISIS, by ISIS after the shocking withdrawal of the second largest, enemy, uh, largest army sorry, uh, in the world, the Russian army, together with the Syrian government's army. No one has a clear idea what had happened there. Why did ISIS retake Palmyra while the whole world was in shock? and busy with the consequences of Trump's winning of the American elections. And the humanitarian catastrophe in Aleppo was escalating at the same time. However, some political analysis, analysis and observers stated that the reoccupation of Palmyra was an attempt to shift the media attention from covering the war crimes that took place in Eastern Aleppo by the Syro-Russian forces. In January 2017, as many, and as many heritage specialists expected, ISIS destroyed the Tetrapolon monument and damaged the nearby theater, as we can see. The hardest challenge of heritage is yet to come. Since the destruction is not all that is threatening heritage at war zones, the real test of Fort Palmyra, for instance, lies in the reconstruction plans that are being prepared. <coughs> Sorry. Conflicts play a major role in changing the urban and social and power structures, and therefore, meanings are being transformed. Based on that, reconstruction plans provide a transformation and new interpretations of heritage, particularly in the aftermath of war, when a new narratives, legends, and symbols are required to rebuild the nation. It's worth to mention that destruction and reconstruction can be the two sides of the same coin as they both aim to po political goals and exercise powers through and over space. Equally, it's often said that history is written by the winners. Therefore, the one who has the right to control the reconstruction processes will be the one who decides how the Syrian and Iraqi heritage will be remade. Up until today, the Syrian war has clearly not ended. But the reconstruction of some parts of Palmyra has already been carried out. Less than one month after the retaking of, of Palmyra, a replica of the Triumphal Ark had been erect, recreated from Egyptian marble and later erected in London's Telegraph Square. Noticeably, the recreation of Palmyra's arch has not reproduced all of the same features of the original destroyed arch, especially the height, material, and most importantly, the reconstruction generated dilemmas of questioning the authenticity of the monument. The reconstruction of the Ark of, of Palmyra represents a similar attempt to the Russian one when they entered Palmyra. Its main aim was to push propaganda on which side of the conflict would be able to reconstruct and rebuild the cultural heritage in the aftermath of war. Moreover, the replica project missed several elements which are usually taken into consideration with physical reconstruction after wars. The reconstruction of Palmyra has been tied to issues that surrounded the process of destruction itself such as cult cultural identity and collective memories. The replica of Ark of Triumph is now in Dubai. <laughs> and then the last aim is to put it back in Palmyra again. Of course, it went from London to New York, then Dubai, then it's going to be in Palmyra. Anyhow. <laughs> Physical reconstruction is part of the post-war recovery and is deeply connected to politics, economy, and culture. Simultaneously, reconstructing places of in the aftermath of war cannot be separated from the psychological and the social reconstruction of the wounded societies. After the, war, after the end of the war in the Balkans, reports indicated that local population in the Balkans felt disconnected from the reconstruction of their heritage, since they were often not consulted about the reconstruction plans. And specifically in the case of the Starry Most Bridge in Mostar city in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Furthermore, the conflict can be protracted on the social level and continue for generations when there is a decision to be made about whether or not to rebuild symbolic sites. The aftermath of reconstruction of cultural heritage can be as destructive as the destruction itself and has the power to prolong violence even after the end of civil war. 
Concerns and worries have arisen in regard to the Syrian and Iraqi heritage fates, since no one wants to repeat the Beirut experience, when the reconstruction was mainly focused on the commercial part of Beirut's old town. The post-conflict reconstruction or the post-conflict reconstruction of cultural heritage should be incorporated with the reconciliation of the local population with all its divisions, ethnicities, sectors, religions, regardless if they were supporting at some point ISIS or the government or everyone, as long as they are part of the local people, they should participate in making the decision. Simultaneously, the reconstruction should avoid the misuse of the people in power to ensure previous examples of post-civil war reconstruction that were directed to serve and support a particular side of the conflict are not repeated, such as the case of reconstructing Spain after its civil war and the Iraqi case when the post-war reconstruction aimed at erasing the Ba'at identity after the US-led invasion in 2003. To conclude, rebuilding, recreating, restoring, or even reconstructing of movable and immovable heritage must not be carried out when the war is still ongoing and should not be rushed or controlled by one party, generally the victorious one. Once the war ends, the discussion about rebuilding, not only the physical, buildings, but also the psychosocial well-beings of community can begin, taking into consideration several factors that distinguish the Syrian and Iraqi cases. These being the multicultural identities, collective and individual memories, and the decisions of the multi-ethnic local populations who are currently inside and outside Syria and Iraq. In my view, no rebuilding or restoration plans can be safeguarded at this stage of Syria's unfinished war. And it's wrong to believe that even state or the modern art restoration technologies can in some way replicate or recreate the authenticity of a contested heritage. So ever since I started my PhD, I decided to ask my audience not to applaud me. And in order to make a pause for questions, I would like, you to, uh, I would like to ask you for three seconds of silence to consider the impact of conflict, not only on heritage, but on over 10 million Syrian population who have been forced to leave their homes and over half a million people lost their homes, lost their souls in order to survive. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Noah, uh, for a great presentation again. Um, I would like to invite all the speakers up and uh, then go over to you, to the audience, because you've talked actually a lot already about the audience now. So I think it's definitely time now to also hear the audience here and, and hear what your views are on, on ways to capture, to present, to preserve uh, cultural heritage. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for four really incredibly uh, stimulating papers. Um, I've been sitting here feeling incredibly uneasy about this term techno-colonialism partly because I'm not really quite clear what it means, and I'm not sure particularly in relation to, to Morshin's work that colonialism is the right word here, and I'm not, I mean, I think it's a great project, and it's certainly a critical project, but I can't see it as a decolonial gesture or a decolonizing gesture in any way. I mean, that refers to a very specific set of liberatory practices, and I'm just worried that we're using a term that doesn't make much sense. I mean, I don't think that Google project is particularly a colonial project. It's an unpleasant project. It, relates to the subsumption of culture into the economy on a global scale, but I, I can't see it as establishing a set of colonial relations. So, I, you know, I just want to question that term. I, I don't have any clear answers to it, but it's something that makes me a little bit uneasy. And I know, you know, it's a very contested term nowadays, imperialism and colonialism. I, I noticed recently that David Harvey was arguing in relation to the kind of political economy that he does that it doesn't make any sense anymore in, in an era of globalized capital to, to, to use outdated terms like colonialism. So I just want to raise that and it seems to me to be unclear. And the second point, which I think is related, is I was coming here um, on the train today and much slightly against my better judgment, I was reading the new book by Slavoj Žižek. Um, and the first chapter of that book engages very specifically with the issues that we're talking about today. And I think it's called something like um, Global Capitalism and its Discontents. And he makes the point that actually um, Western powers are very, very happy for people to talk about these questions. They, they love it when we sit here together talking about issues around culture and colonialism. It, and I, when I saw pictures of Boris Johnson and Christine Lagarde cheerfully standing under this uh, reconstruction of the Palmyra Monument, this, this made sense to me. He said, what makes them unhappy, of course, is when we talk about 
what might be more properly colonial processes, which are about exploitation, about the uh, unequal um, division of resources, about the trafficking of arms, about the exploitation of natural resources through oil companies and things like that. I'm just wondering, you know, really how we might begin to connect discourse of culture. And I know that some of you did that in your talks, actually. One of you spoke quite eloquently about class relations, for example, in relation to what you're doing to, to the real processes of colonial encounters today. Anyone? Anyone? Else? <laughs> yeah. You have your own. Oh, I yeah. have a microphone. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think, I think the two kind of things that you touched on right there in terms of talking about colonialist practices and when we use that word, I mean, I think the history of colonialist practices is particularly important here. When you talk about exploitation um, and division of resources, you know, archaeology as, um, a, as, a, as a field and as a subject was very much involved in the exploitation and division of resources, um, particularly in the Middle East, which seems to be what we're focusing on uh, here today. And in terms of uh, justifying the subjugation of people, archaeology and history was a huge part of that. Um, and as we've touched on in his presentation, uh, talking about this kind of Western narrative of these places, and, and it's very specific places in Syria that we refer to as cradle of civilization, and it's being this kind of continuation that eventually evolved and led into the great European civilizations um, and kind of left the rest of it behind in the dust to not be as evolved. You know, that all of these narratives were very much a part of colonialism. And I think that when we, particularly in the media um, and when we cover subjects like this, we are, and we just continue to repeat those narratives, I think to take colonialism out of it um, and to separate the history of that subject from, you know, its, its precedent in the modern day. Doesn't, I think that also equally doesn't make any sense. Anyone else wants to jump in here? Or? I'm sure this will be continued. Yeah, you can. Um, it's not going to be a direct answer to your question, I guess, but I could say that um, I'm also wary of these big terms, and I, for instance, in our little practice, which is very, very small scale, it's um, mostly about accumulation of these gestures, which lead us to pose certain questions. For instance, uh, it, it is for me, from a very personal point of view, um, all these uh, gestures taught me to pose questions about a private university museum selling off one third of their collection at an auction a couple of years ago. Because uh, as practitioners, you know, artist friends, creator friends, writer friends, we realized that we had no idea about the, the rules of the accessioning, for instance. And if we think about the university museum, you, you would think that an it's an institution, it's an academic institution, so they will be good custodians, so to speak. But um, we realized and we learned that we were pretty ignorant about all of these regulations because obviously they got the permission from the Ministry of Culture and um, just to sell off the collection because, you know, by the law it says that uh, for to get the protection of the ministry, it has to be an artifact. It has to be older than 100 years old. So all the modern artworks and all the contemporary artworks, they're basically not protected by the ministry. So it's so for us, you know, it's a, that's why I'm just saying that these small gestures led us to ask those questions and say that you know it is not a legal discussion at the end of the day. It's more an ethical one. You know, who are the, the owners of these works? I mean, obviously, you know, the the question gets much more layered when it comes to, to heritage sites, but um, for me, I would be more on your side about not using those terms from a very personal point of view. Another question is coming up. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to Noor for giving us a very good explanation of what contemporary colonialism actually might be, um, and um, and then I have a question to uh, to the people from the um, um, the architecture, the forensic architecture team, <laughs> uh, because I was especially um, following on Noor's uh, presentation. I was really interested in the um, in the relation between the reconstruction and the testimony, um, and then. Um, about the relation between the reconstruction and heritage and and I think the two of you talked to those two different 
terms. And I just wonder how, how do you bring those two together, um, in, especially in the context of the questions that Nora was asking about, uh, which is, you know, what are the powers there that play there? Um, Um, I, don't, I don't know whether you bring them together. I think the, what we tried to do in Sydney was specifically not recreate the experience of Sydney um, for an audience, although it was at the same time a, a, a sort of report and a sort of documentary project. Um, and there were there are aspects of the project that had the potential to be more realistic, and which we decided again. Um, and we had a lot of discussions about that during the project. So we could have recreated the, the look and of the cells much more realistically, and that was something that we strove not to do because we ethically was not something that we were comfortable with doing. Um, as uh, the, the modelling is part of... It's very difficult in this project to disentangle the testimony and the modelling and the methodology um, because, as you can see from the videos, they're all very much um, part. They're, they're all. This, it's all the same process. It's all coming out of one thing. You can't sort of separate them. I mean, I think yeah. for me, it wasn't necessarily about um, making any kind of equivalency between. I, I would never even attempt to make an equivalency between what the you know what the uh, victims of Sednaya had gone through and you know what and the kind of loss that's experienced when heritage is destroyed I don't think that's comparable um, but I do what I sort of took away from it and took away from the methodology and what I sort of hoped to get across when I was speaking um, was just the kind of idea that people you know witnesses in the case of human rights and um, you know kind of local people in the case of heritage studies um, is that there is so much to be learned from that, you know, from giving value and respect to their testimony in that case, and to kind of, and taking, I think that for me was the takeaway, um, and that's how those two projects are kind of connected, um, in my opinion. Yeah, this also, I mean, it was, much, it's a, it was a project about raising awareness, it's part of a campaign to raise awareness, and that was really the fun, that was what we were trying to do with with this project, but when Nora and I were talking just briefly earlier, and we just mentioned Sydney, and you said I already had, you already had a concept of Sydney. Yeah, but it's because it's, because it's um, yeah. I like it. because you're supporting my argument in some way or another about the object objectivity of the media, because like I'm not sure if everyone familiar here with the concept, like because in Syria there are like two major prisons, prisons that have been deployed during the war. Sydney, one of them, is it's been deployed like since like the 70s and the other one in Palmyra. So when ISIS entered Palmyra, they didn't destroy only cultural heritage sites. They also destroyed the Palmyra prison. So my question would be like for them, for their project, since they are like doing forensic architecture, why do we reconstruct something that is exist now? Sydney prison is exist and we could in the future get in there. Why don't we like reconstruct something has been already destroyed, for instance? And that's the second, the first part. The second one would be like, why do we have to reconstruct uh, a scar in the memory? Like if you are like, let's imagine anyone here, he had an accident, hopefully not. But, and you went to a doctor and the doctor told you like, you have a scar in your face. I can reconstruct it and you will have it as it is. And yet we can leave it. Or I can heal you and we can delete it from your memory and make a new operation for you and forget about it forever. So why do we have to reconstruct a dark heritage sites, if we may say? Yeah, I don't know if we do. I think that the, the testament, the people giving testimony about Sydney had decided to participate in the project specifically because Sydney is still operating and because they felt they had a sense of um, of duty, of responsibility, and generosity to people who were still in prison there. That was the only reason that they were putting themselves through was an extremely difficult process. Um, I don't think, but again, the idea was never really to reconstruct the night. It's a human rights reporting tool. It's a document. Um, it was about giving people a platform also to yeah. be able to bring, you know, to sort of bring their experiences to light and giving, and I, I, I was just sort of thinking, at, you know, the, it is, 
it seems so obvious, but it is kind of amazing actually how many people don't believe witnesses. Um, we have a, there's one guy who keeps going after us on Twitter, um, who keeps, he, this, this, he's, a, he's a man who works at a university in Australia, um, and he keeps coming after us over um, a different project that we did where we reconstructed a mosque that had been bombed in a US airstrike. Um, and he keeps saying, well, how, who are these witnesses? And these are people who were there, who, whose families and lives were horribly, horribly destroyed um, based on this airstrike, and many civilians died. Um, and the, which the U.S. military denies, but that's a, that's a whole other problem. But the, the, there's this man who keeps going after us saying, like, how do you know that these witnesses are good witnesses? Like, how do you, well, we spoke to them and they were there and we trust them and we respect them. Um, and he just, uh, simply, it, it's, it's this, this bizarre Twitter war that's been going on for a long time now with us and this one man. Um, but he just absolutely doesn't understand you know, where we're getting our sources from. Like, these aren't sources. They're not, it's, this isn't evidence. So I think giving people the platform to be able to tell their stories um, and to tell their experiences in a way that's respected is really important. Got one more question. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, bring the question of technology possibly back into the discussion. Um, I mean, obviously what constitutes the kind of heritage object um, has always had this thing around an original and a reproduction, or in terms of reconstruction, it's always with the idea of some original event. Um, and somehow, I guess the this evening is suggesting that uh, by technology, I guess we mean the internet and digital tools, is in some ways. Um, uh, creating a new possibility for authenticity. But I just also think you might think that, you know, technology um, is another kind of reproduction uh, in terms of, say, uh, simulation. So it's not like, why do we, I mean, one can see all the reasons locally why you might want to do, engage in a forensic uh, architecture using technology or using, uh, nor as you were saying, advanced technological means of reconstruction. Um, but I just wonder what you think the promise, maybe I'll simplify the question there, what, what do you think the, uh, what is technology doing in the, in the actual process? What is the agency of technology in your projects? You know, what's the politics of the technology in the project? Well, I don't know. you wanna answer or should I? Um, I mean, I can say briefly, I mean, I, I think the kind of politics of technology is that it is both, it's, it has this massive potential for inclusion and this massive potential for exclusion. Um, and I think the, that's kind of the tension, is that on the one hand, um, it's so great that we're able to bring in, you know, we have the possibility at least to bring in so many different voices um, in ways that are in, in ways that are accessible like we have never had before. Um, and to be able to communicate with witnesses and communicate with people on the ground in ways that we never could. Um, and then on the other hand, technology is expensive and there it's in the hands often in the hands of the few and there is this unequal division of resources about who actually controls technology um, and I think that is kind of where the tension lies for me. Um, from my perspective and from archaeological perspective um, technology in general is more like a documentary tool because technology cannot replicate or recreate the authenticity of a destroyed cultural heritage site. The same example I gave about the Ark of Triumph. Ark of Triumph was established like 300 BC by the Roman Emperor to humiliate, not to humiliate, let's say, to represent the victory of the Romans, who in some point in the history humiliated the queen of Palmyra, Zenobia, and took her in chains to Rome. So in order to humiliate the Syrians, so they established this Ark of Triumph. Many Syrians, including me, before the war, we didn't know what's the representation of this Ark of Triumph. When it was destroyed, People started, yeah, let's do reconstruction. They went to London, they did it. But then, when we dug into the archaeological and historical records, we discovered it's like, it's representing the humiliation of the Syrian population. And it's destroyed now. Why do we want to rebuild it again? <laughs> like, just think about it from this perspective. Like, for instance, like, I'm not familiar. If you are familiar, anyone here is familiar with Warsaw? Yeah, but that's what I mean. The technology allowed that to happen. Yes. Or, for instance, the 
Yeah, it's for yeah, if it's for like yeah, but it's for a documentary. It would be great, but to replicate it and to put it again to continue the humiliation of the population that doesn't make any sense. And at the same time, for instance, in Warsaw, when the communist period, Stalin he came in, he established a building. He's like a twin brother of the Seven Sisters in War in Moscow, the Palace of Culture in the middle of Warsaw. Polish people, they tell you, if you want to see the best view of Warsaw, you should go on the top of Palace of Culture because you can see everything except Palace of Culture. <laughs> Seriously, so if this Palace of Culture is destroyed, do the Polish people want to rebuild it again? Because Stalin, he built it to remind the Polish that the Russians were occupying them at some point or another. And the same point here, and this is a contemporary example. We can use the technology. They use the technology for the, the Buddhas of Pamir. Since 2003 until now, the German, not the German, the Swiss and the Japanese government, they were funding 3D reconstruction with lights. And now, like two months ago, they realized that we want, they want to do physical reconstruction. So now in September, they will gather in Japan to put a plan for physical reconstruction. Although the local population, they don't want to rebuild these Buddhas because mainly, like the population there, they are Muslims. They said, we're not Buddhists. We don't want a Buddha statue here. But they accepted the point of 3D reconstruction. But physical reconstruction, they didn't accept. But anyway, nobody cares. Because there is money for that, and politics plays a major role here. So that's why I'm telling you, like, technology is a really tricky weapon and can like, continue the conflict on a social level. Thank you. Um, so I think this might be part of your question. Um, this is for, for Noah. Um, very high for me, sorry. <laughs> um, you showed some very powerful um, images in your presentation, um, and it struck me that uh, so much of this is about spectacle and a war of, of images. We have these images of deconstruction, and then we have these images of reconstruction. Um, and, and as we know, the um, videos by ISIS and the, the photographs by ISIS it's all very much about a performance, the costumes, the camera angles, um, the way that the objects are being destroyed, for example, in, in the Mosul Museum. Um, so the image is so much part of this propaganda machine, and we share these images over social media. And I'm wondering, um, and also the same with Boris Johnson and his image in front of the National Gallery um, of the reconstructed arch. And I'm wondering, as researchers, heritage practitioners, archaeologists, whoever we are, how we talk about these instances of destruction and reconstruction without becoming part of this propaganda machine where we show these images uh, because they have so much power every time we see them we're, we're shocked and that somehow reproduces the power that ISIS wants. Indeed, I mean like, uh, thank you for your question because this is actually part of my PhD project and I got, it, I got this question uh, as part in the interview. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no worries, it's okay. So, um, the point is, like, I got this question also from a different angle. They told me, like, do you think the local population, they do care about the destruction of their heritage if they are losing their lives, their families, and their relatives? And at the same time, how we are not using, how we are using these pictures. So, the main point is, in my PhD project, is to collect the individual voices from all the refugees. Not all the refugees, that's impossible, because more than half of the population in Syria and almost like third of the population in Iraq, they are like displaced. So I'm going to interview the population in four EU member states and three neighboring countries of Syria and Iraq, Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. But before interviewing them and surveying them, the most important point is raising the awareness. We should raise their awareness about the importance of heritage. This is the representation of destruction. This is the representation of reconstruction. You have to be neutral. And then you should decide how, this, how do you value this heritage. For instance, the Great Umayyad Mosque in Aleppo. Beneath it, there's a, uh, an old cathedral. And beneath it, there is also a Hellenistic Agora. Many people of Aleppo, my city, they see that this mosque, they don't want to see Aleppo without the mosque. This mosque is partially destroyed. But why don't we do archaeological excavations? Perhaps we can uncover a new part of the collective memory, memory of the Syria, which would, at some point, accelerate the reconstruction process and generate economic resources. This thing needs like a raising awareness plan. And of course, you cannot control this raising awareness plan without having like a democratic, let's say, uh, ways and tools. Because 
The government in Syria wouldn't allow that. They want to redo it as it was before the war. They want to delete the seven or six years of the memory. So during this period of war, they want to reconstruct everything as it was before the war. So there is no representation for destruction and reconstruction. That's why they are rebuilding Ark of Triumph and they will put it back again as it is. So the war didn't touch anything in, the Syri in Syria. So the main and the most important point of any reconstruction plan is raising the awareness about the importance of, ar of archaeology as a discipline which would unify the wounded societies after the war. I don't know if you answered my qu your question, <laughs> but yeah, it feels like I got lost some point. <laughs> Any other comments from you, Ian? If I may add something to what you were saying about collective memory, one of the examples that's been quite um, inspiring for me is um, it's a Shinto shrine in southern Japan, uh, and they are having, maybe you are familiar with that example, because they have, they have an ongoing conversation with UNESCO, World Heritage Site um, Group, and um, basically what happens is that for the last 1,200 years, for every 20 years, the local community destroys the shrine and reconstructs it. And uh, when they have the conversation with UNESCO, they're saying that we want to protect you because that's an amazing value that you are creating. But you know, how do we negotiate that on, you know, if you want to continue to, to destroy it every 20 years? And uh, the, the answer um, is, a, is something that I quite uh, appreciate. They say that you know, what matters for us is not the, the permanency of the architectural structure, it's basically about the transfer of knowledge from generation to generation. So you know, you, you can teach your children how to use the material in the forest where the um, shrine is located, how to process that material, and also you know, how to basically build something communal with that material, knowing that it will be destroyed again in 20 years. You know, it was, maybe it's an extreme example, but you know, it's one of, um, it's an example that I quite appreciate. I think we have time for one last question. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, another one, attempt around there. There's heritage on the one hand, and then there's technology. But I just wondered about time, you know, particularly in relationship to your last response there. You know, um, what, a heritage object, it seems to me, is only constituted in time. And does technology, does the internet, change what we understand as the contemporary. You know, that, it's as if all of this is happening in the now and it's urgent for now and we must uh, make reparation for now. But doesn't technology multiply time or uh, shift time? Isn't time different for different people in different bits of the global world? So how does, how does time, you know, your argument depends very much on you know, time in relationship to the war. Well, I think that if there's anything for sure that internet will be rebuilt in 20 years <laughs> in a completely different way, but yeah. please. Yeah, I have like some of my friends, they are working. I'm sorry, if you want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead, go ahead. No, so ladies first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I was just, I mean, I, I, I sort of agree with that. I mean, I, thi I, I think there is something very funny about the sort of obsession with reconstruct, taking these 3D models and scanning everything and making sure we document it. Like, why now? These things, you know, when you talk about something that's been around for 2,000, 5,000 years, why do we want to reconstruct this exact moment in time, in this long life history of this object? And I think it's kind of funny, you know, when we go and, and we read, you know, people do sort of repairs to an object or restoration, and there's this very sort of delicate balance about restoring an object, but not enough that you can see the restoration, because if you can see the restoration, it might not look like the like ruins with vines on it that we kind of like the aesthetic of. There's, there's this very funny tension of making sure something looks old, but not that it's crumbling, but it has to look like it is crumbling a little bit. It, 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 does, it does actually, it's a very sort of funny problem in heritage and what, you know, this sort of heritage boom and there's this whole industry around it is, is kind of, it, it's an old but also the way it is now is a very recent phenomenon. Um, and I, I do find it very sort of strange that we need to have everything exactly as it is in 2017. And that's what we're documenting. And it's not about making something look like it was originally or it was 100 years ago or how it might look. It, it's right this second. And I do, I do think that's odd. <laughs> <laughs> she did it. 
I think indeed um, this is a very good final uh, comment. I think indeed we work, we won't um, linger on it too much, unfortunately. Um, I wish we had more time, but I hope to see you again next time. And I thank you very much for your presence here, and also thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.